there's something about an unapologetically sleazy 80s film that feels somehow lost to the ether. With directors, writers, musicians, and artists trying to nostalgia trap the 80s vibes and aesthetics in a bottle and commodify them for the past two decades, it's apparent that modern sensibilities won't allow creators to fully capture the aura. There's too much water under that bridge. That's why the real thing, in all its sexist, racist, queerphobic loneliness, feels so much more authentic, and why period pieces from the era feel antiseptic at best and whitewashed at worst. And it's this kind of socio-anachronism that prevents us from ever truly recreating past experience. You can't step in the same river twice. So here we have Body Double, which might be peak sleaze as far as 80s mainstream films are concerned. It's the brainchild of Brian De Palma, who became a master of merging high-concept giallo aesthetics with post-Hitchcock psychosexual scuzz, which was almost always entertaining even if you had to apologize to your brain afterwards and take a shower. In this case, De Palma distilled his essence by putting everything he'd become known for, sexual exploitation of women, disdain for Hollywood culture, and riffing on Hitchcock, into a metaphorical blender and purifying it to 190-proof De Palma. Zerus of choice this time out being Vertigo and Rear Window, which is all well and good, but his critique of Hollywood fakery comes off as the pot calling the kettle black. We're spying on some spoilers, so... Be warned. Body Double tells the tale of Jake Scully, not to be confused with the Avatar guy, nor to be confused with Bill Maher, even though actor Craig Wasson is often misremembered as Bill Maher for obvious reasons. Jake is a struggling actor who just landed a role in a crappy low-budget vampire film called Vampire's Kiss, four years before Nicolas Cage would star in a movie with the same title and 13 years before Buffy the Vampire Slayer would give us another Billy Idol-inspired vampire. What are you doing here? Five words or less. Out for a walk, bitch. Unfortunately, Jake suffers from claustrophobia, which jeopardizes his job because it involves a lot of coffin work. Plus, he is not setting the world on fire in his other auditions. You are working. That's good now, isn't it? His acting coach tells him it's because he's holding back. But Jake struggles due to some childhood trauma about getting trapped while playing hide-and-seek. Hey, been there. Old houses didn't used to have spring locks back in the day, and I found that one out the hard way. And Jake finds his girlfriend, played by genre fay Barbara Crampton, cheating on him. He needs a place to crash. Fortunately, Sam from his acting class, played by the always great Greg Henry, has to give up his apartment-sitting job for a few weeks as he has an acting gag out of town. It turns out the house-sitting job is at the freaking Chemisphere house, which must not exist in this timeline because they treat it like it's just a swanky modernist apartment. You may remember the Chemisphere house design from such media properties as The Simpsons, where Troy McClure lives. It was designed in the 1960s to be the, quote, most modern house in the world, end quote. And at the time, it certainly was that. It now stands as a Los Angeles landmark along with a Hollywood sign. Besides the posh setup, Sam points out that there is a beautiful woman across the way who does a strip tease and masturbation routine every night at the same time, like clockwork. Jake, who has apparently never seen a beautiful woman in Los Angeles before, becomes enamored with her and watches her for a solid three minutes of the 90-minute runtime. But then I guess there's something to the illicit voyeurism aspect when you're not supposed to be watching. In fact, most of the next 10 minutes of the film are Jake, and therefore the audience, looking through the telescope into the neighbor's house. He sees her being assaulted by a Mac the Knife style robber and observes her routine again the following night. This time there's a Native American construction worker welding a satellite who also stops to take in the show. That's like one third of the village people right there. The funny thing is, and this is an intentional joke by De Palma, Jake makes a disgusted face at the construction worker who is billed simply as the Indian, but the Indian isn't doing anything that Jake isn't also doing via telescope or that we're doing by movie screen. In Hitchcock's explanation, they'd be the Fortean pole to enjoy and process the world in a scopophilic way. In Brian De Palma's parlance, yeah, you enjoy it too, don't you, you pervert piece of shit? And I'll see you cover in your eyes. I don't know why Brian De Palma always sounds like Dennis Franz in my head, but Dennis Franz is playing a De Palma-esque director in this film, so maybe that has something to do with it. The next morning, Jake notices that the Indian has returned and he's talking Gloria, that's the neighbor. 
Gloria is played by former Miss USA Deborah Shelton just before she joined the cast of Dallas as a regular. Jake and the Indian buff follow her to the mall, but somehow Jake comes off as the creepier one of the two, getting chased off by security for peeping on Gloria as she tries on underwear. He also steals her old panties out of the garbage and shoves them in his pocket. Remember, this is the guy who is supposed to be the less creepy guy following her. It's all okay though, as the Indian tries to snatch Gloria's purse, and Jake gives chase. Unfortunately though, they run through a tunnel and Jake experiences vertig- um, crippling claustrophobia. Gloria finds him and thanks him for his effort, and for some reason, they start making out with the 360 degree backdrop thing from Vertigo playing in the background. This is weird because it's a clear homage to Hitchcock, but in Vertigo, the point of the scene was that Jimmy Stewart couldn't escape his trauma, and he was sucked back into the memories of the fateful tower. Here, Jake is recalling two minutes ago when he was on the beach with Gloria. Man, I haven't thought about those times in a good 35 seconds. Good times, ma'am. There's also no reason for Gloria to suddenly start making out with him outside of De Palma promising us sex and violence. Just as Jake is about to round third base in the middle of the tunnel, me, Gloria snaps out of it and runs off. Speaking of sex and violence, Jake continues to spy that night and sees the Indian break into Gloria's house with a drill as he tries to rob the contents of her safe. Unfortunately for Gloria, she catches the robber in the act, so he turns on her. Jake races over to save her but gets attacked by the dog and is unable to get up the stairs. <laughs> The police somehow find a way to blame Jake for Gloria's murder, even though he has an alibi. And if you haven't realized it by now, De Palma is attempting a critique of the artifice of mainstream storytelling. The film opens with a fake-out scene from a movie, followed by a fake-out desert backdrop, followed by a blatantly fake rear projection driving scene. Jake's life becomes a series of coincidences, some because they were planned that way, enter the narrative, and some because that's just what the movie requires. We're gonna have the two leads in a sex scene, but they never had a conversation. F*** it, have her be so grateful that he chased down the mugger that her panties drop right then and there. Jake has to become a suspect in her murder, even though he has two witnesses that clear him of the crime. F*** it, have the police antagonize him anyway. As far as I'm concerned, you're the real reason Gloria Ravel got murdered. He's about to happen upon a one in a million break in the case? Why? Because it's supposed to be that way by design and the audience is either too dumb, too horny, or too coked up to care. Or as Hitchcock would say, they'll go along with it because I tell them to go along with it. But maybe there's more to it than that. To be clear, De Palma has said in interviews that he has a disdain for this view of the audience, and his films are so filled to the brim with that attitude that he's practically screaming to be called out on it, because then people will pay more attention to how films manipulate them. The problem with that is that De Palma so singularly pushes the envelope here and doesn't do anything else to signal parody otherwise, that he just comes off as a bad writer. And critics and the audience have gotten so used to plot contrivances in their other movies, as long as they're having a good time, that they look the other way. In other words, yeah, we know, we're not dumb, just go make better movies. And almost immediately after this, De Palma did start making more serious movies. Anyway, getting back to the topic of sleaze, do you remember the Louis C.K. joke about how you can judge how bad a person is by how long after 9-11 they waited to masturbate? Well, we're not shown how much time has passed, but it seems like it might be the same night after you watch Gloria get killed and her body dragged away, and Jake is sitting in the rotating bed watching porn. Have a little respect for the dead man. While watching an ad for Holly Body's latest, he notices that her routine is the exact same routine Gloria used to do before she was killed. Holly also has the same little Holly tattoo on her ass that Gloria did. For no other reason than the plot demands it, and we are two-thirds of the way through the runtime, Jake goes undercover by getting a role in the world's most expensive porno film. It's here where we get the most memorable scene of the film, as they shoot a full-on music video for Frankie Goes to Hollywood's Relax. Jake successfully meets Holly during the shoot, and they go back to the sex scene with Gloria. See, now that makes more sense. Jake convinces her that he's getting into producing and he wants to take her with him to the big time. But it's all a ruse to trick her back to his apartment so she can confess to being Gloria's body double. Jake probably figured all this out by watching Vertigo before he switched over to porn, because that is the exact plot of that film. Holly thinks he's a creep and storms out, only to get picked up by the Indian, who is, of course, Sam. But Sam is actually Gloria's husband, 
a guy by the name of Alexander Ravel. Jake races to save Holly, and the whole thing climaxes at an empty grave, with Jake being buried alive. But De Palma isn't done Hitchcocking yet, as we get the North by Northwest ending where we don't see the climax, just the aftermath. And all is well! Jake gets his vampire job back, Holly seems to become some sort of body double consultant, and Hollywood just keeps on churning them out. Now, body double is gonna be divisive. De Palma knew that when he was making it, and the film flopped because Columbia Pictures got antsy about the film's initial X rating. And this is something that De Palma says he was going for after he fought tooth and nail with the MPAA ratings board over Scarface. In fact, to hear De Palma tell it, the whole thing was an exercise in passive aggression toward the Hollywood system that looks down its nose at the porn industry while covering for guys like Harvey Weinstein. The ratings board is a part of that system. The plot is nothing more than a mirage created by stitching together Hitchcock movies, but again, that's by design. De Palma went out of his way to make sure that there was very little substance to this film in order to call attention to the power of fantasy and cinema. De Palma repeatedly returns to film as a medium designed to trick the viewer. It's what the entirety of Blowout was about. And here he calls attention to it again and again through the themes of filmmaking, acting, and fantasy. I like to watch. The poet, playwright, and director Bertolt Brecht was revolutionary for his use of what is known as the distancing effect in his plays. I talked about Guy Debord and Spectacle and the Nope video, and how Spectacle acts as a sort of anesthetic for your critical thinking. The enthralling emotional beats of a really well-told story pull us in and make us feel, while also getting us to shut off our brains to what else might be going on. Recht, and to some extent De Palma here, tries to ensure that the audience is never too engrossed in the story itself. This allows us to be more critical of what is going on cinematically. And while it works on that level, an area where the same technique falls flat is with the narrative. The screenplay is, to put it nicely, a massive dump of hot garbage stuffed into a giant used condom and slung into the face of an unsuspecting public. And I say that as a fan. Mostly, this is due to a miscalculation about how a Brechtian critique works. This is an absolutely perfect film to show in film school, because De Palma's direction is so showy and his production value so apparent that it can't help but call attention to itself. But that doesn't happen with the writing because everything is Hitchcock pastiche, so we're down for it. Let me explain. The reason why the car chase scene in The First Connection works is because it feels so gritty and real. Gene Hackman is right there at the wheel, after all, and at any moment he could die. And I mean that sincerely because William Friedkin just did not give a f But as an audience, we're immersed. So when we see Jake Scully with an old-timey rear projection, or we hear Helen Shaver's voice inexplicably come out of Deborah Shelton's lips for no discernible reason, I know. we're acutely aware that we're watching a film. The same is true with screenwriting, which is what Kevin Williamson does so deftly with Scream, Joss Whedon does with Buffy, and the Always Sunny in Philadelphia gang does all the time. Boy, I tell you, she's got a boyfriend, but I think she and Greg should end up together. Ooh. I'd like to come back next week to see if they do. They critique the medium and the genre, and in doing so, critique their inherent ideologies. I just wanna tell you all, go f yourself. <laughs> this is also why, going back to the opening, you can't replicate the 80s fully intact. It's like hearing a joke for the second time. Even if you laugh, it's with an awareness. And it's not the same as it was on first experience. So, knowing that, the screenplay should call attention to itself and its shortcomings as a means of critiquing narrative storytelling, ideology, or both. The same way De Palma does with the aesthetics of storytelling and the visuals. And there's a lot missing here. But because we are aware that it's just warmed over Hitchcock, and Hitchcock's films were masterpieces, we fill in the blanks with Hitchcock's character motivations, plot points, and other explanations, so the story becomes more immersive than it really should be. Here's an example. In Vertigo, go watch it if you haven't seen it for God's sakes, it's sight and sound's greatest movie of all time, you have no excuse, just go watch it. In Vertigo, Jimmy Stewart suffers from acrophobia, which he finds out at the worst possible time when he's on a rooftop chase of a burglary suspect. Now retired from the force, Scotty, Stewart's character, accepts a private investigator gig to follow an old college chump's wife to see where she goes. After following her around for several days, Scotty saves her from drowning and has a conversation with her about why she fell into the bay. Intrigued by her moth-like desire to kill herself, 
and because she looks just like Kim Novak, Scotty falls in love with her. It's not pure romantic love though, it's mammic possessive love. She seems to fall in love with him too, but the force inside her drives her to the top of the bell tower, where she falls to her death. Scotty, unable to save her because of his acrophobia, feels a tremendous sense of guilt. Scotty deduces that his friend set him up as a witness because of his acrophobia. And when a cinema's most convoluted plots, Elster, the husband, killed his wife beforehand and hired a lookalike to lure Scotty to the tower. Then at a pivotal moment, he threw the wife's body over and Scotty witnessed the fall, assuming that the woman who went up was the same woman who came down. And if you know all that, it's excusable as to why you wouldn't question how Alexander Ravel's plot is supposed to come off. Near the end, Craig Wasson is screaming into the phone for those of us too thick to get the scheme. But in the original film, Jimmy Stewart is the perfect witness because he can't make it up the bell tower. Jake's claustrophobia doesn't prevent him from calling the police or making it over to stop the murder. The only thing that stops him is the Ravel's dog attacking him. The claustrophobia only plays a part in the beach scene and even then Alexander would have to know that Jake would follow Gloria all the way to the beach and then chase him into the tunnel, which was not even a necessary part of the witness scheme. In Vertigo, it works because Kim Novak's character is in on the plan. She guides Jimmy Stewart exactly where they want him to be. In Body Double, it's because Jake is horny. But even after watching this film probably two dozen times of the past 40 years, I still never question it. Why? Because it's Vertigo. And if it worked in Vertigo, it must work here, it's the same plot. Only, it's not. Body Double is a one-man show. Vertigo is a two-person con, and the second person is vital to the con. The same can be said for why Jake suddenly mounts his investigation in the last third of the film. In Vertigo, there is no investigation. Scotty takes it as an article of faith that he witnessed a tragic suicide up until the small slip-up at the very end of the film. In North by Northwest, Cary Gray has to conduct an investigation to clear his own name. But here, the detective openly tells him that they have nothing on Jake. I'm not gonna hold you, Scully. We got witnesses to back up your story but they blame him anyway for not calling the police. In fairness to Jake though, there was a security guard in the house with her right before the murder. So there really aren't any stakes if Jake decides, damn, that's messed up about that woman's bad luck. That's too bad, she was hot. He's not gonna get arrested and he knows that he's not to blame for her death. I mean, he took a dog bite to the juggie for God's sakes. I think he's earned absolution on this one. That's also why it makes no sense that Alexander Ravel throws on full makeup to pick up Holly on the road, when A, he was just watching them through the window five minutes earlier, and B, Holly's never actually met Alexander Ravel before. This guy called me up and said that he had seen my self-help routine and he just sent a messenger over with money. But we need it for the Scooby-Doo ending at the reservoir, so there it is. I mean, how do you even get the spirit gum on there in that short amount of time? And yet, with all the 80s coke-infused sleeves draped over these Xeroxed Hitchcock notes like Gossamer, I still kinda love it. There's something about De Palma being so pissed about how Scarface was treated that he made an ode to the porn industry out of spite. And in spite of being copied from someone else's homework, De Palma always has an audaciousness of spirit in his films. There are at least a dozen similarly themed thrillers that I've seen where I've said, that would be so much better if De Palma had made it. Yes, it's sleazy, yes, it's dumb. Yes, it stumbles through a hackneyed climax, but it catches a moment of ect American culture that is distinct and raw and authentic. And I can't help but appreciate that. Stay frosty, stay safe, wash your hands, return your shopping carts, make good choices, and I'll see you next time. God, have you done? You're a big pony girl. Any dance at the club, oh my, my.